Hello, good afternoon, friends. I'm sorry that on the very last lecture we had a delay due to technical snags. We have repaired it. Uh, today will be the last lecture of this series of lectures for this course. But still, you are supposed to submit your assignments and supposed to get the marks back. And also, we will have a viva voce exam. Let me tell you and all and the concluding session. Today is a tutorial to be taken by Dr. Surinder Singh. I don't want to waste any more time. Uh, Dr. Surinder Singh starts now. Uh, good afternoon, you all. So, so uh, uh, we will be talking about uh, the uh, tutorial part of this uh, neutron reflectometry, polarized neutron reflectometry. So, as so, I have shown you uh, this uh, slides like property of neutrons, uh, uh, where uh, will be uh, because we have uh, <coughs> uh, parameters to evaluate. Uh, today we will do uh, we will uh, calculate the uh, different kind of potential value of different kind of potentials. Uh, reflect index and other uh, things. So I just wanted to show this uh, property of neutron. So this, uh, you know, I mean, we can use as a particle as a wave, wave uh, this uh, neutron and what is the mass of neutron is written here and uh, typically uh, uh, spin and what is the uh, moment, okay? And which is, uh, if you see uh, this mu is, uh, uh, minus uh, it is mu and mu n is the neutron magneton and the value is written over here so typically you can you can you can change from energy to velocity and temperature with all these relations okay so like uh, wavelength in nanometer you can change when you know the velocity in uh, meter per second so uh, let us uh, Okay, so uh, what we have uh, studied earlier is uh, the potential seen by neutron in case of reflectivity in, from the thin films because as I said, uh, it, uh, it treat it as a uh, uh, medium and medium means we have a density of atoms like if we have a nickel, then we have nickel uh, potential, uh, neutron will see uh, the potential in nickel medium and which is defined like this, okay, and this N into B this n into b is nothing but the scattering length density where b is the coherent part of scattering length okay and n we know the number density how to calculate we know uh, we want uh, the density of nickel in gram per cc and then avogadro number and then this is atomic mass okay so this n you multiply by the b value of that particular element which medium consists of then you can get the scattering length density and the nuclear potential. Uh, for uh, this uh, all the elements in the periodic table and the isotopes also the y axis is on the b value in Fermi and this this is the uh, atomic uh, mass of different elements on here and you can see uh, there is a complete scatter of this scattering length density and you you will see uh, there are few like uh, one of the things i have marked over here is nickel 62 and nickel 58 so you can see for nickel 62 the uh, the but around 10 okay so so this this shows that that this uh, uh, new example i will just do the, all this calculation one of the example i want to show you is this this is again the nickel natural and nickel 68 and you can see what 
what uh, how this uh, scatting line density or which we sometimes we call contrast from one layer to another give us the reflectivity okay so you can see here we have made a multi layer of nickel natural nickel and nickel 62 i just now i told you the b value scatting length for uh, nickel 62 is uh, is okay that's it right? was that No, no, okay. So, okay. So, uh, is all right now, no? Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, I, I just saw this uh, picture over here. It's going. It's all right, no? I can continue, no? Okay. So uh, I, I just now I said uh, we have uh, different scattering line density for even isotope and uh, how uh, this is uh, handy in case of reflectivity. You can see if you, you make uh, a multi-layer of nickel 62. You can see nice uh, black peaks are coming over there. Is all right? I think there is a little bit technical problem today. So, should I continue or should I stop? Problem, eh? You want to uh, connect again? Okay. Okay, so uh, here you can see the black peak from uh, neutron reflectivity, but whereas in case of X-ray, because X-ray can't distinguish natural nickel and nickel 68, it is just a single layer for X-ray. Okay, and you can see from here, from this scattering line density profile, for X-ray it is a uniform with thick layer of nickel, because it can't distinguish between natural nickel and nickel 68, and whereas for neutron it is a multi-layer. So this contrast uh, things we can uh, uh, use uh, when we uh, we want to study some particular uh, uh, films, okay, and like a diffusion of this different isotopes in a multi-layer. Then from neutron we can clearly distinguish the same. So uh, this is neutron scattering length density. Uh, there is a, a nice uh, software and the which I have written here. This uh, NIST site is there, from where you can calculate all the uh, value of, uh, neutron scattering length density. Like uh, one of the example here, cobalt uh, element, and uh, for X-ray also we have we have to just give the wavelength. What is the wavelength we are using for X-ray, and what what is the material that they have the uh, uh, data bank for all the elements okay and then you straight away get the scattering line density okay what is the real part like this this is for cobalt 2.26 10 is 1 minus 6 for neutron 
and this is for x ray 63.02 10 to minus 6 so this is one of the things to uh, calculate uh, the scattering line density uh, for uh, any element so uh, let us see uh, how to how to uh, calculate this so i have given here one example of silicon so how to get, uh, calculate the nuclear scattering and density for the silicon because this is one of the nu uh, this nuclear scattering and density is one of the parameter uh, we have to supply for uh, getting uh, for um, uh, fitting the reflectivity data okay so silicon we have all the information like what is the z value what is a atomic mass what is density and here also we have uh, the current scattering and density it is 4.15 fermi okay and then also the absorption so we have all this information and how to calculate this is scattering line density so first we, we calculate n number density it is density into avogadro number by a and we have to just take care of the unit like like density is 2.33 gram per centimeter cube but in our calculations uh, we have uh, uh, we have to uh, i mean depends on uh, which software you are using so depending if you want in angstrom inverse here in my software i give uh, this is scattering and density in angstrom inverse so we have to we have converted this uh, density into uh, gram per meter cube 2.33 into 10 plus 6 then 6.02323 is avogadro number and then this is atomic weight and it comes out 4.99 into 10 is by 28 okay this uh, number density per meter cube now if you calculate n into b b value is as i said it is 4.15 for me so if you calculate this multiply n by b which is written here this n number density and this is your uh, b value and then you get scattering line density it is in meter uh, uh, minus 2 so if you multiply by you know, that uh, angstrom value then you get 2.073 into 10 to the power minus 6 angstrom in, uh, in angstrom for minus 2 or minus 2 so this is scattering density for silicon so for a single element if you have all these values if you know the density of that element you know uh, um, atomic weight you know the uh, uh, you already have a good number and you know the b value and since this absorption is very small so we can most of the element for neutron scattering so these elements uh, uh, have low absorption coefficient so we just talk about the real part so from this we calculate what is the scattering and density for silicon now you see now suppose you have a compound like al2o3 okay so uh, now how to calculate scattering and density for this cell okay so what what we have to see we have to get the information for aluminium and oxygen so aluminium we know the what the and density of this element not not the individual aluminium and oxygen density but density for this compound okay so we should have information what is the, uh, the scattering length for aluminium what is the scattering length for oxygen and then what is the density for this compound okay and uh, you can calculate the uh, molecular weight for this compound also should I wait or what? Okay. okay. So, so these things uh, we can, um, uh, if we know all those, we can calculate scattering line density of this. So, how to calculate this? So, as I said, we have uh, this uh, molecular weight we can calculate for this density for this Al2O3 is 3.95 into 10 to the power 6 gram per meter cube. Okay. And then molecular weight we can just calculate 2 into aluminium plus 3 into oxygen it comes around 101.96 gram per mole okay now we have b coherent for aluminium 3.449 but we have two aluminium here so two into like we we did molecular weight because we have two uh, two atom of aluminium so we did two twice of the atomic weight of that similarly here for b coherent to get the b coherent of whole this compound we have to multiply two times of aluminium B coherent and three times of oxygen B coherent value. And it comes out this one. And then just multiply this N into B because, because uh, from here we know B coherent uh, from uh, molecular weight and density. We know uh, uh, the number density, how to calculate, which is just now I explained for in case of silicon. So 
from this if we multiply that n into b coherent b coherent value we just now calculated so it comes 5.6 is 10 to the minus 6 angstrom minus 2 power minus 2 so this way we can calculate this scattering and density for any element or any compound whatever the stoichiometry suppose we have la uh, lpcmo so la has 0.7 so so we have to get all the uh, information of scattering length for different element which is in uh, there for that compound and on what which fraction they are in the compound we have to uh, evaluate b value like like we do for uh, molecular weight okay so this this is uh, the things how we calculate scattering length density for any uh, element or any compound yeah so now let us see uh, we have defined in very first lecture or uh, kind of what is the kinetic energy what is the potential energy for neutron and you know the relation kinetic energy e equal to h square k square by 2m okay and k is nothing but 2 pi by lambda it is amplitude of uh, wave vector of neutron in air or in the vacuum so it is 2 pi by lambda where lambda is the wavelength of the neutron okay uh, which you can calculate from the uh, uh, energy also this lambda now see uh, and these are the constant like h cross has this value 1.054 in terms of minus 34 okay joule per second mass of neutron is uh, 10 to the minus 27 kg 1.67 okay and suppose we have a neutron of wavelength 2.5 angstrom okay then we want to know what is the energy kinetic energy of this neutron which has a uh, uh, wavelength of 2.5 angstrom which is a uh, thermal neutron okay and we also know uh, the relation one joule and electron volt so we can calculate the kinetic energy in electron volt okay so but just using this formula e equal to x cross uh, k square uh, k cross uh, k square by 2m you put these values over here you will get e equal to 0 0.01307 electron volt which we write 13.07 milli electron volt okay so because all the parameters here you just plug these parameters in this relation and you get this energy so this is called kinetic energy so we know uh, our thermal neutron has energy of milli electron okay now let us see the potential we we define this nuclear potential this fermi pseudo potential which is uh, b equal to 2 pi h cross square by m nb nb is this nb is the uh, uh, just now we said nucleus scattering length density and this we have just calculated for silicon you know in the previous slide we have calculated what is and we for silicon okay and as i said this b value and all this information you can get from any uh, database and one of the site i have shown you is the nist site where one can calculate this nuclear scattering line density so let us see now calculate the potential in electron volt and then we can compare this energy and the potentials seen by thermal neutron a neutron of 2.5 angstrom and the medium of silicon suppose we will take the case of silicon silicon we just calculate this nb value equal to 2.07 10 to the power minus 6 angstrom mi uh, power minus 2 okay and then you put all the other values like h cross like m and then calculate v value so this vn comes around 53.8 nano electron volt okay so if you just this is just uh, plugging into these values 1.053 10 to the minus 34 square into 2 into pi divided by 1.6749 10 to the power this mass value you just put this and put value of nb you uh, will get uh, this potential in, in joule okay and then uh, you can convert that joule into electron volt by uh, using this relation 1 joule equal to 6.242 10 to the power 18 electron volt and then you comes uh, this value comes out nano electron now you can compare the uh, kinetic energy of thermal neutron is milli electron volt and uh, this is nano electron volt. so we have around 10 to the power minus uh, this milli this is minus six uh, order less this potential so that's why we can treat it uh, like a one dimensional potential where where our kinetic energy is higher okay so let us let us see uh, what what other kind of uh, interaction a neutron has so another potential 
which we can talk uh, about magnetic potential. So magnetic potential again, uh, we can have some idea ki, uh, what, what is the value of this magnetic potential comes from for the thermal neutron. So the relation we know uh, for magnetic potential Vm equal to minus mu dot B. Okay. Or if you calculate this, this plus minus comes for a spin up. Uh, uh, this this uh, becomes minus because our this value is z value is minus 1.3 this becomes positive value then and then we have inside plus minus so for spin up we have plus gn mu n b gn with the just a constant value so z minus gn is plus 1.913 mu n mu n we can calculate as we said this is neutron magneton okay uh, sorry nuclear magneton so it becomes uh, this value i have already uh, shown it is a standard value you can see from the table uh, which i have given over here in the first slides i have shown you here so this is uh, mu n is 9.6623 10 to the power minus 27 and then you cal you multiply that thing by one point uh, multiply by 1.913 then it comes about 5.0505 into 10 to the power minus 27 joule per tesla so we know uh, this b this b uh, is the magnetic induction and it is in joule so uh, but uh, sometime uh, we know suppose we have a magnetic sample of iron then iron has a magnetic moment we know 2.2 mu b this we know and you 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 may be knowing how to change this 2.2 mu b into tesla i know this is um, uh, this you might have done your uh, your relation class when okay, whether uh, how to convert from magnetic moment mu b into tesla so it is nothing uh, like like we have a mu b of one iron atom so how many iron atom is there in a uh, uh, in uh, one uh, cc that we can again calculate from the number density okay number density into this will be our uh, 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 moment per volume okay and then that that is our uh, magnetic field and then you multiply by mu zero which is permeability of free space mu zero which has 2 pi into 10 to the power minus 7 into so basically what i what what i want to say here is this if you want to change this into two point this two two point two point two mu p so how to make into test tesla is two point two into you know the value of mu b like uh, bohr magnetron value you know how much it comes so bohr magnetron i have not given here and then you you multiply this Bohr magnetron value, and this is a standard you can uh, get from any table. And then number density, okay, and then into mu zero. And this, if you calculate, this value comes out around 2.2 Tesla. Okay, and now the potential seen by neutron in iron medium is mu n into 2.2 tesla it is 5.0505 so it becomes bm becomes 2.2 tesla into this 5.05 this value 5.0 it this much joule and then you can convert that you can convert that joule into again electron volt which is a pretty simple from here you just multiply this one and then you get voltage okay this this becomes voltage uh, sorry uh, this become potential uh, for neutron in that medium so typically we get this relation if we don't know this what is the tesla for the medium i mean what is the magnetic moment in the medium what is the magnetic uh, induction field in, in the medium b value in the medium then this is the relation just calculating this mu n value into nano electron volt it becomes 60 nano electron volt per tesla 
and in case if you multiply by 2.2 it becomes 132 nano electron volt so magnetic potential or neutron thermal neutron in a uh, iron medium is 132 nano electron volt and if you want to compare this with the gravitational potential or neutron so gravitational potential is defined v equal to mgs where mass of neutron g is gravitational gravitational acceleration and this is height so suppose for 1 meter of height we get this potential around 100 nano electron volt so typically we know uh, we have uh, nuclear potential which is again in the range of 100 of nano electron volt we have magnetic potential which is again in the range of 132 nano electron volt and then we have a gravitational potential which is again in the 100 of nano electron volt for neutron and this feature this gravitational potential initial phase it was used because i will explain next slide it, this method this potential was used to calculate the reflectivity from unknown material and then calculate b value how i will also in the next slides okay before that before that i have defined here the refracting index and this we have seen in the first uh, our first um, um, lecture uh, introduction of neutron reflectivity how to get the refracting index of a medium so sub, this is uh, i just said the energy conservation this is the medium one this is medium two so in medium one we have just kinetic energy so is written h square k square by 2m this is kinetic energy of neutron where which has a scattering which has a wave vector of k1 and in uh, medium two we have both kinetic energy as well as potential energy so we are just using this energy conservation and putting this value and now in the medium two we have a potential and you put that value of the potential which is nothing but 2 pi h square by m rho okay and then you just simplify this you will get this this relation i mean here what you are doing you, you this cancel out this h square m and then you have k2 square equal to k1 square so this goes this side k2 square minus 4 pi rho so this gives relation of k2 and k1 and from from uh, literature we know the refractive index is defined n square this n square equal to k2 square by k1 square okay so this this defines the refractive index of the medium okay and from this relation n square becomes so so basically you divide by k1 square so this becomes n square here this becomes 1 and this becomes 4 pi rho k1 square in this relation or we can say uh, further simplifying because k1 we know k1 square is k1 square is 2 pi by lambda whole square so if you put 2 pi by lambda whole square we get n square equal to 1 minus lambda square rho by pi or we can say uh, on the root of this n equal to on the root of this and uh, for first approximation we can say 1 minus lambda square rho by 2 pi this is a refractive index for medium okay where the scattering and density is rho and wavelength of the neutron is lambda okay so uh, if you if you if you uh, further uh, do these things okay uh, transfer this thing into e and v you will get this relation like this n equal to under root 1 minus v by e and we know for thermal neutron we have energy of around 10 milli electron volt in that range okay because just now we calculated for 2.5 angstrom it was 13 milli electron volt and then we have a potential of 100 nano electron volt okay so you can see this term v by e. so so uh, and this this 100 uh, nano electron volt actually we have this b value because this uh, potential depends on the maximum potential is for the medium for the element which has higher value of rho okay other things are constant so the maximum rho so maximum potential and nickel is the one of the element in periodic table which has has value for this rho and that becomes that comes if you calculate the potential for nickel it comes around 250 nano electron volt 
okay and if you if you see uh, this relation so our uh, sometime uh, uh, people say uh, how to how to store the neutron because store store storing a neutron means if you make a bottle of neutron bottle so inside if you put the neutron inside it should remain there how it will remain there if 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 it doesn't cross uh, the well, uh, i mean um, it doesn't cross the boundary of the uh, this uh, bottle or it reflect inside from the surfaces inside surface and remain there so in principle we should get uh, we know the theta c we can calculate from this uh, refract index also because we know cos theta c equal to n so from if you see to get any material okay which which you and if you make the neutron bottle for you make a bottle from that materials i mean things like that then what should be the condition that everything the neutron of a kinetic energy of 10 milli electron volt if you want to keep inside that bottle so you should have the material such that the from this relation okay you should have v should uh, sorry uh, is the condition for that should be because this should be higher than one so it should be e equal to less or equal to v so you should have some material which has a potential neutron potential such that which is always higher than its kinetic energy in the air so this is the condition for making a neutron bottle and and you, you can see from here we have a, a typical thermal neutron we have 10 milli electron volt and potential is 100 nano electron volt so how to achieve how to make it more than this so practically there is no such material available but yes there is other things when you can uh, uh, you can uh, reduce the energy of the neutron you can further reduce the neutron of uh, the energy of the neutron when we call cold neutron or ultra cold neutron where the energy becomes uh, a, a fraction of the milli electron volt and uh, their wavelength becomes around 100 or 500 angstrom then you can achieve you can make th that kind of things okay like i said ultra cold neutron lambda equal to 500 angstrom you can calculate what is the energy of that 500 angstrom a neutron around maybe fraction of milli electron volt okay so if you can so so in principle people are making uh, in the reactor in the source uh, neutron source they are making a ultra cold neutron and then studying these kind of things because this this feature is mainly used to study the fundamental study fundamental study about the neutron like what is the uh, uh life uh, life uh, uh, lifetime of this neutron what is the electric uh, dipole moment of neutron so, so 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 this this property is being used there okay so they they what 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 they do they make a uh, they use take a material and reduce the energy of neutron make them ultra cold neutron and then they, they fill those neutron in the bo bottle okay and then see um, see uh, how how uh, with time this neutron count is reduced and then from that they can calculate the lifetime of the new free neutron okay so yeah so uh, one of the uh, one of the basic property which i said uh, by comparing this uh, gravitational potential for neutron and the potential in the material if you use that property one can use this b value scattering length scattering length of the materials so this was the early experiment people have done what they did they compare these values what 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 the, 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 they have designed a neutron reflectometer which is called neutron gravity reflectometer just for measuring the b value of different material what they did so if you see uh, we have just now seen uh, the value of these two potential they are very comparable okay so if there is a neutron which is falling in a vacuum okay suppose a neutron is falling in a vacuum with the, this gravity 
though it is it has a velocity also so you know uh, uh, the um, trajectory of this neutron is uh, is very well known problem i mean we have done in the schooling it is uh, like a parabolic uh, uh, trajectory comes out because it it has a horizontal velocity over here but it has also gravitational um, uh, x, uh, i mean this uh, mgh potential of also here due to gravity it has this uh, potential over here so if you calculate this it comes as a parabolic path for neutron okay so so from this this h this h is height it falls at a distance some distance okay uh, from uh, uh, from your so 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 what people have done they have just made a horizontal beam of neutron okay these are the slit this k1 k2 k3 you are just making a uh, uh, straight uh, uh, path uh, i mean you are making the neutron uh, should pass in a horizontal line initially okay from here and then a uh, free falling uh, kind of free falling uh, in a uh, vacuum medium and then you put a sample over here at different height you put a sample okay and then calculate the reflectivity from that at this height this is your uh, reflectivity you calculate that intensity so then then uh, it is crossing that then you are lowering the i mean you are increasing this height from here okay so from this condition from this conditions you will get this h0 so h0 says the neutron should that the height should be such that h0 below this h0 height whatever is falling in this it has to reflect this is like a condition of uh, external reflection so h0 h0 is the minimum height when neutron start penetrating that surface of your sample which you are putting over here at different height you are putting the samples okay and neutron is reflecting back okay so up to h0 suppose this is h0 height so this is below the critical angle we have everything is reflecting what is whatever is falling on the sample and after h0 height what happens still if you see then you will have a fraction of reflectivity and you see the reflectivity pattern over here this is reflectivity and this is the height and you can see below this is one uh, i'm sorry it may, may not be so visible so i can read out this this is 1.60 meter this is 1.62 meter this is 1.64 meter okay and these are reflectivity 1.9.8 and you see up to up to a height of up from here from here to a height of 1.61 we have reflectivity 1 so this is a critical phase and below this it has started penetrating inside the medium and below this you have a reflectivity falling like this so so from this critical angle you can calculate you know this height okay this was 1.61 meter and without knowing the wavelength of neutron though a wavelength wavelength of neutron is required when you design the instrument but here nothing is required to measure you just need the height and you calculate you you estimate the value of b for that element so this was the very uh, one of the uh, um, first technique to use to uh, calculate the value of b which nowadays for each element is uh, tabulated uh, by uh, um, i mean estimating uh, this value mainly from this techniques so you are making a thin films of materials which for which you have to calculate b and do this kind of uh, reflectivity experiment and then see at what height you have a different kind of reflectivity and then without knowing uh, i mean without uh, any things you just calculate you know this h0 and other part other things are known uh, you calculate and the scattering line density okay so from this and you know the number you can calculate for that element then you can calculate b value this is one of the fundamental uh, 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 fundamental quantity one should know about any element what is the scattering length okay and as i said uh, this uh, fundamental the, the, these things uh, this neutron reflectivity and um, uh, the principle of reflectivity refracting index is being used wide uh, all the um, uh, big facilities neutron facility like uh, neutron lifetime estimation of electric dipole moment and as i said estimation of scattering length so this is very important and you can uh, just now we have just now calculated this parameter and you know uh, uh, this uh, this these are uh, in the range of nano uh, uh, these are in the range of the nano electron okay
So this was the one of the uh, things we can uh, apply Newton reflectivity. Okay. So uh, another another thing in this tutorial, I want to say one of the important uh, thing uh, which is uh, I mean uh, uh, you want to use uh, practically uh, in case of uh, especially in case of polarized neutral reflectivity. So in theory, what we uh, we have, what we have studied is Fresnel reflectivity. It is nothing but n1 minus n2 whole square by n1 plus n2 whole square. So what does it say? Whenever neutrons see a change in refract index, the fraction of it. Uh, give a reflection okay and reflectivity is calculated like this and I, I i told you the reflectivity from specular reflectivity we have different kind of scenario one one thing is uh, roughness where you have a clear cut roughness okay i mean you can see you can distinguish between a and b this is material a grown on uh, sorry material b grown on a but here is another condition at the interface at this region you, you you cannot distinguish because because there is an intermixing is happening so there is no clear cut uh, uh distinguish between the boundary how this a is going to be b is going to be okay so as i said in a specular reflectivity both of them gives you can take care of this reflective in the reflectivity and and by choosing a sigma square which is roughness which we have already said it is the both combination of both both intermixing as well as height contribution but sometimes you have a clear layer alloy layer formation so how these things incorporate in your reflectivity pattern when you analyze your data so when you have this alloy this is quite different than this intermixing as well as this um, oscillus this uh, height height distribution and this intermixing both of them can be treated as a roughness but when there is an alloy formation then you you treat it as a separate layer so you, instead of two layer you have a three layer system a, a b and alloy of a and b okay so you you can uh, split in your reflectivity pattern this so let us see uh, how to incorporate these things in your reflectivity so i said the uh, in specular reflectivity the reflect this roughness component is incorporated as a debye waller like factor so what what is that we have a fresnel reflectivity from two surfaces a and b and then we just multiplied the reflectivity with exponential q q is this uh, q is then a reflectivity pattern we know uh, 4 pi sin theta by lambda and sigma square sigma square we are say roughness so either you just calculate this way or other way other way is you this is this is the things you are considering there is a this is a sharp interface and then this is a reflectivity for sharp interface and just calculate this sigma this value and then say you have considered the roughness at the interfaces but there is another way of doing this and this is more helpful in case of polarized neutral reflectivity which i will explain when you, you when you talk about the structural roughness and magnetic roughness then this another another method which is called change of nucleus scattering density at the interface using a error function so I, I, as i said you can straight away use this but consider the things when you have a structural boundary and a magnetic boundary a magnetic sample sometimes what happens at the interface the magnetic roughness may not be the same as the structural roughness so that time how to calculate magnetic roughness how to separate out magnetic roughness and structural roughness that becomes that that you cannot implement this way so what we do so what we do we we suppose this is our nickel and this is our uh, air interface okay so here we have a roughness of 10 angstrom suppose so what we do in this case we 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 know this is the scattering line density for nickel and for air it is zero okay so if if there is no roughness it is straight but if there is a roughness you can modulate this you can modulate this like this by just using this error function so what you are doing you are using iron this is the this factor is b iron n iron n is the number density this is scattering line density of nickel part and in between how you mo are modulating this you are changing change, changing the difference of iron and this and using this error function what you have done you have smeared out it and the the 
the distance here it is double of this sigma square this roughness so what i mean to say you just plug this debye wall factor like this or you modulate your scattering line density such that and both fortunately both of the those method give you the same reflectivity pattern and how to implement this you can make a small small number of layer and consider so many layers over there okay and then calculate the reflectivity like we do for multi layers okay so this is becomes quite handy when we assume a structure and magnetic roughness at uh, this this uh, i have given you ex example uh, in my second lecture where i have shown you iron germanium system we had a iron germanium uh, 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 sorry tri layer of germanium iron germanium on a silicon substrate and you see this is was the x ray reflectivity and we found it out this is the scattering line density for electronic scattering line density from x ray a nice uh, this was substrate then a germanium then iron then germanium and there are nice interfaces and and but when we did a polarized neutron reflectivity because here we we have just one information we can just plug into that debye waller factor and calculate the reflectivity but when we did the polarized neutron reflectivity with the same method we cannot get the best fit but we had to do this kind of things we have to assume two scattering line density one for nuclear part another for magnetic part and then we can say there is a magnetic roughness which is higher than the nuclear part at this information we can get when we can modulate our reflect uh, because, because what is happening at the interface when we are saying roughness change in roughness when we are saying change in roughness i will show in the previous slide here so basically what is happening we are change in roughness means our density density is changing at that density change we are showing here like this we are saying this is not the sharp change but there is a modulation with error function okay at that that is equivalent to consider roughness like this okay so this is handy in the sense that we can assume in a magnetic film we can assume different magnetic interface and with respect to the structural interface okay so one of this uh, thing we can apply here for uh, uh, in case of neutron reflectivity so uh, next thing is how to uh, how to uh, implement that uh, alloy things maybe five more minutes no, no, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So uh, here I want to show uh, which I didn't explain uh, during my theory class. So I thought I will explain here uh, the kind of effect of roughness. Sometimes roughness, uh, just uh, if you see if you have a small alloy forming at the interface, I you say that we can maybe we will just vary the roughness parameter and uh, we will get the fit for the our uh, X-ray neutron reflective. It doesn't help. You have to, in case of alloy formation, you have to consider alloy because what happened at the interfaces, at the interfaces, when you just assume a roughness, the scattering line density profile doesn't follow as if we consider a separate layer over here. Like, like here we have a nickel titanium multilayer, okay, on this substrate, this is nickel titanium and four bilayers of that, okay. We assume a very small roughness here, so you can see there are sharp boundary. Uh, sharp uh, sharp uh, scattering line density change at the interfaces okay nickel to titanium titanium to nickel and then we assume a higher roughness now you can see effect of roughness second uh, things which uh, i said we are using error function so you can see our scattering line density is variation up to a higher uh, a higher depth which is which is just because of the roughness higher roughness so here roughness is in this first case roughness is lower in case rough in this case roughness is higher so you can see how the scattering line density profile looks like so so we are modeling this interface by error function and you can see this modulation is higher here and the reflectivity pattern x-ray reflectivity pattern from these two is shown here the top one red one is the lower roughness we have just increased the roughness in uh, at the interface of nickel titanium. Then at higher Q, we have a uh, shift in reflectivity pattern. Okay, this blue one shows that. But when there is alloying forming at the interfaces, which we have shown here, like at the interface, you can see there is small interface uh, that is fractional of nanometer, maybe around nine angstrom or eight angstrom thick alloy layer, which has a scattering line density. This one. Okay, 
at the both interfaces okay then reflectivity pattern becomes a uh, uh, Oh, sorry, this was higher. Higher roughness was black. Reflectivity pattern becomes like this. So if if we assume that this blue one is due to alloy, this black one black one is due to higher uh, roughness. So so you can see the fall from higher uh, for, with for higher roughness the fall is larger at Q range. But because of alloy, there the fall is not that much, and that we cannot include just this alloy formation. We just cannot uh, avoid here. We have to assume a separate layer. If we say, okay, our roughness will include that alloy layer, but which is not correct because you can see the change in reflectivity pattern, a very the large difference at higher Q. And this alloy layer, as I said, is very thin, nine angstrom thin. Okay, and this happens. So, so, so we should able to distinguish from our uh, reflectivity. And this is uh, basically this is a, a plus point of this technique that we can. Uh, talk about the alloy layer in the fraction of nanometer forming at the interfaces okay and we can separate that from the roughness things which is uh, there at the interface okay and you see this is and pnr is more handy in this respect because we have now if we have a magnetic sample now you see we have two kind of reflectivity r uh, this red one is r plus uh, spin up and this blue one is uh, r minus or we say spin down Newton reflective and here I've shown three cases which just now I explained for x-ray low roughness so nice reflectivity pattern Bragg peak is coming because the repeatability is there roughness increases you can see the reflectivity is falling down you can see that this reflectivity is second order Bragg peak it was here here it has gone down okay because of roughness now we have alloy layer again only nine angstrom alloy are the interfaces and in this case this is the nuclear part and this bottom is the magnetic part and what we are considering here what we are assuming here is that the alloy layer is non-magnetic so you can see in the bottom layer here in this region or at the interface this blue la blue line is not following the this black one black one is scattering line density for alloy but magnetization for this alloy is zero and only nickel has the magnetic moment okay and now you can see the reflectivity pattern from these three how drastically this is different and this this can for uh, i mean this difference can uh, be seen in this plot very nicely which is i said uh, this is a spinner symmetry or sometimes i'm saying uh, normalized spinner symmetry which is which is defined as r plus minus r minus difference between two reflectivity divided by sum of two reflectivity same reflectivity pattern we have just plotted this one okay and you can see uh, how it looks like so uh, red one is when there was roughness low roughness other interfaces black one is the higher rough interfaces but when we assume a alloy layer non-magnetic alloy layer forming on interfaces it is quite different you can see okay so this way this technique sometimes becomes very good uh, even um, uh, resolution you can get uh, more than uh, tm and other things okay uh, by tuning uh, proper magnetic things okay uh, you can uh, get the information of the roughness uh, as well as you can separate out that alloy formation at the interfaces okay uh, one one more thing uh, I just want to say about uh, one of the uh, other uh, this um, uh, I mean um, technique both uh, X-ray and neutron uh, they have uh, been used for one of the important property in our uh, uh, solid state physics which is called diffusivity and diff diffusivity in very uh, uh, small length scale are the interfaces and how to calculate how to uh, get that is uh, we we get uh, a change in reflectivity when there is alloy formation at the interfaces and that change in reflectivity with respect to uh, without uh, 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 like like here i have given this 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 is reflectivity when the uh, when we have annealed the sample where we have given the temperature treatment to the sample for a time of t and this is the reflectivity when we have just grown the sample as deposited so there is no diffusion process in this case. We assume there is no diffusion. But when we anneal it, then we are giving a thermal 
uh, SOC to that sample and then there is a diffusion process happening. And then what is the diffusivity of that particular element? We can uh, estimate that value using this reflectivity technique. And this is the relation how we calculate that. So what is happening when we anneal the sample, our Bragg peak intensity goes down. So here we have shown three cases, neutron reflectivity shown. This black one is as deposited sample. When we have a just, suppose a, a system I have not written, nickel titanium, then this is the Bragg peak, nice Bragg peak and a KZ oscillation, you say as deposited. When we have annealed this sample, nickel titanium, at around 573K, then this Bragg peak has gone down. Then further annealing at higher temperature for fixed time, then there is no Bragg peak. And this difference is clearly shown here. Near the Bragg peak, three uh, reflectivity pattern plotted in the same scale, you can see as deposited. So, so this relation, from this relation, if you uh, put this, uh, these intensity, the reflectivity at uh, as deposited reflectivity at different temperature, in this case, you will calculate what is this DT value. This is diffusivity. And once you know the diffusivity from this reflectivity pattern, you will get the what is the diffusion length of that particular element at the interfaces. And it, this uh, this is very handy things to study this kind of uh, uh, property in the solid state physics also. And once you know the diffusivity, you, 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 you also uh, know the activation energy of diffusion for that particular element. And for nickel and titanium, uh, I have shown for two samples. Uh, this is uh, a different temperature we have annual three temperature we have annealed and this is diffusivity we have got and uh, for different uh, temperature and these are the uh, if you if you plot uh, this d uh, log d by 1 by t and then you get this uh, because because you know uh, the relation uh, is uh, exp decrease exponentially easy by t kt so from that if you uh, plot the uh, log of this d uh, as a function of temperature, then you can slope of this uh, curve will give you the activation energy. So this was the another important part for neutron neutron X-ray reflectivity, which is being used for uh, getting uh, this kind of uh, bulk property of the material uh, in, in very small length scale at the interfaces where we are talking about a fraction of nanometer. As I said, we could distinguish around nine or eight angstrom uh, uh, thickness. Uh, alloy formation at the interfaces and then diffusibility uh, of uh, around uh, uh, three order less than the what we uh, get by the bulk uh, technique using this x-ray and neutron reflectivity we can calculate that kind of diffusivity in the thin films and multi uh i just want to maybe maybe two minutes i just want to give here the comparison now because i was thinking to give a uh, comparison of uh, x-ray and neutron reflectivity so the, because the question arises because nowadays we have a synchrotron source a, a very powerful i mean a lo lot of intensity x-ray intensity there but as as i said in very first lecture how why can't we do any uh, magnetic uh, uh, magnetic inform can't get magnetic information from x-ray is from this relations because our cross section for magnetic uh, divide by cross section for charge in case of x-ray comes out of 10 to the minus 6. But now since we have a synchrotron and we have other things like we have a uh, we have high intensity x-ray source, we have tunability, we can go to quickly go to the another wavelength. Okay. And another wavelength here I mean to say because what happened, uh, we know the element had different uh, resonance or different energy. So if you sit at a particular resonance at those resonances we have a huge uh, value of scattering this 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 parameter goes uh, like uh, it is increases as uh, it becomes as much as that uh, uh, we can do the uh, magnetic information from x-ray also so that much is it increases at the resonances okay and we can tune the polarization so, so, so these are quite handy things has come up due to the synchrotron source. So uh, the question is, do we still need PNR? So I would say, yeah, uh, I will not go into detail. I just want to say, yes, there are so many positive things from the, this X-ray techniques. So what we do, we, we, uh, we uh, uh, 
we uh, tune the energy of neutron such that so such that we are sitting at one of the absorption is of that particular element like the l is for iron you can see this this these are the resonances we have these scattering and absorption coefficient they are increase as compared to the total value of charge value of this so this things if we we uh, we use we can get the x ray reflectivity magnetic reflectivity again uh, this is square whole square reflectivity is whole square n1 minus same principle n is defined as 1 minus delta minus i beta and this uh, this delta is here earlier it was just f0 and f dash but if you have a magnetic sample it becomes f dash magnetic and as i said if you sit at the resonance this value becomes quite large now comparable to this value so that's why you are able to do the uh, magnetic signal also also the beta which is absorption part we have charge and we have magnetic contribution for that so just this is like a hard x ray only you have to calculate these values what is this charge value for delta and what is the magnetic contribution and once you know, you know these two value you can calculate the absorption part uh, by just uh, this uh, Fourier relation which is called KKR uh, relation I won't go into detail but I just want to say how to calculate these values we have XMCD XMCD we get the absorption like cobalt we have you choose tune the energy of your wavelength uh, such that we are sitting at the cobalt L is and then you do the uh, spin dependent like uh, uh, left circular polarized x-ray and right circular polarized x-ray you put on the sample and with that particular energy range then you have a different absorption for different uh, polarizations and then you see you have these absorptions absorption from absorption you get this value absorption you will get uh, this value okay F, F double dash this uh, for uh, for charge you get this contribution and for magnetic you get this contributions charge and magnetic contribution where it is coming from so absorption is giving you charge but how magnetic contribution the difference between these two gives you magnetic contribution so from these you are getting this beta value and then uh, using these value you can calculate these value but this is not so straightforward this is still very difficult to do that because you should have the total uh, energy range these values then you can calculate the reflectivity so this is not as straightforward as in case of neutron we have just one potential one b value there is no other contribution which need the correction okay so and but the advantage disadvantage is because we have to do the soft x-ray and we have the soft x-ray we have little sensitivity the thickness is around two nanometer sensitivity for xmcd so if if we have a multi-layer and we have information of this uh, uh, f1 f2 absorption and uh, magnetic part of just two nanometer we cannot talk about the whole uh, layer structure multi-layer structure so 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 this and also if you do reflectivity then the, this uh, this again becomes around 220 nanometer uh, uh, sensitivity in case of uh, reflectivity also so what what we say yes because because these techniques are just surface technique we we have a lot of theory involved so we we say that pnr is still required very much required because this is the only technique which provides depth resolve absolute magnetic moment and this is sensitive to magnetic induction including stray field and uh, uh, as i said and earlier also the, the, because because it doesn't depend on the substrate material and other things and there is no interference of the optical terms which i just now i said you calculate from xmd signal some optical coefficient then calculate their uh, non absorption part from the kkr relation all those things involves lot of uh, things which uh, which doesn't give you the accurate value and in neutron we just apply a bond approximation which we are doing we just use the fermi gold uh, uh, potential and calculate these things so there are so many advantages using neutron i would say neutron is very much required and if you do x-ray yes you will have some additional information because it gives the element specific but those information are not reliable because that is just surface sensitive techniques and this with this uh, i would uh, say uh, thank you uh, for your kind attention 
yeah dr basu want to say something to you first formally if there are any queries you please post them through chat mode that our singh will uh, address them so this completes the course material so we have gone with you for last 40 lectures uh, 40 odd lectures and maybe 6 to 8 tutorials uh, so this time to say goodbye but not final goodbye because i am waiting for your assignments so that i can evaluate send them back to you and we will have also a viva voce exam uh, i will quickly let you know when it is i sincerely hope that all of you at least many of you have submitted your uh, tutorials quite nicely done you have done quite nicely uh, i will send you the marks the ones which are being evaluated and i have already sent you the marks for the ones which i have evaluated so uh, all the best i hope this course was of some use to you and it is not just the end of the course i hope that this is the beginning of some of you at least uh, continuing into neutron diffraction for the specific problem so because this course are covered a huge tuck like magnetic diffraction magnetic reflectometry small angle neutron scattering so various length and dynamics scale has been uh, sort of uh, covered by this course and i'm sure you will need it in future for some of your studies so now i formally close the lectures and thanks for attending questions any questions of oh, mankar